Hello, my name is Daria Fasun and I'm a freelance colorist and compositor. And for full disclosure, I also develop the training materials for DaVinci Resolve's color page. The purpose of this video will be to summarize all of the solutions that I've found for working in Fusion in a variety of color management environments. So this will be less a tutorial and more of a reference video. So something you could potentially return to in future if you start up a new project. I get the feeling I'll be watching this video as much as anyone else because I forget things very quickly. It might get wordy at times because I'll be explaining my motivation for doing things a certain way, especially at the start. So if you'd like to jump to a specific solution, uh, please do click on any of these timestamps. And I've also included a written summary of all my setups in the description, which I'll update if I find a better way to do something or if the software changes. If you do decide to keep watching, I'm going to offer some context for my research. So why color management can be tricky in Fusion. I'll also include my list of restraints and intentions for my solutions, you know, so exactly who I'm targeting. And also, I'm going to show you how to set up the Fusion template graphic that I'll be using in this video so that you can follow along if you wish to do so. Okay, let's get to it. DaVinci Resolve, as I'm sure you know, features this system of pages, which I find pretty extraordinary. Uh, they allow you to edit, grade, mix, and composite projects without having to turn files over to other applications, which means there's no time consuming rendering and no juggling of you know, file standards, compression, color information. You don't need to be told all this, this isn't a pitch. Uh, I'm sure you've been enjoying the pages. But the reason I say all this is because the Fusion page in particular is a unique component of this system. It's designed for high-end compositing workflows, which means that it operates in its own internal color space, which is independent from the rest of the pages. And that color space is sRGB linear. I'm going to be saying that a lot in this video. This is generally not an issue in non-color managed projects, and for the most part, it works fine in standard dynamic range as well. But in high dynamic range, in DaVinci Wide Gamut, and in ACES color management, we start to see a disconnect between what we see in Fusion, in Fusion's viewer LUT, and in all the other pages. This is directly related to Fusion's internal color space, to what the Fusion LUT is designed to do, and what Resolve's color management is anticipating when it maps the Fusion signal. Over the years, in conversations with colleagues and with my own online research, I found a variety of effective solutions for these problems. But these solutions have not always been relevant to my own workflows. And in fact, I found that some of them behave more like band-aids, you know, so they're more short-term solutions for very specific problems that a particular colorist or compositor was having. And that meant that they were not always stable across all media types, or they failed when switching between deliverables. So I wanted to research and present options that would be as widely applicable as possible for the average user. The requirements I set for myself were to present solutions that would work for beginners. So there would be no complex backend coding or installation of third-party color management systems that were future-proof. So that meant that the setup would not require additional configuration uh, for future deliverables and that would work within Fusion's own color space. So, you know, you should still be able to take advantage of the 32-bit floating point working space of DaVinci Resolve and the Fusion Viewer LUT when possible. I think I've been able to achieve this, but if I realize in future that I made a mistake or if I find better solutions, I will update my written summary, as I've said, and uh, pin the post in my comments. All right, without further ado, let's set up our project. I'm going to start a new Resolve project. So I'm naming it Fusion No Resolve Color Management. All right, and then I'm going to head on over to the edit page. As you can see, there's no bins or timelines. I'm going to open up the effects panel, uh, go into effects, and there I'll find the Fusion Composition Generator, which I can drag and drop to then generate a timeline in the edit page. All right, now I'm ready to head on over to Fusion. And one of the benefits of creating the Fusion composition manually is that you now have the media out node that comes together with this composition. I'm going to move across my page here to place it at the end. And uh, the media out is the state in which your composition will be entering all the other pages in Resolve. When I started doing all this color management research, I quickly found that I needed a strong visual element in Fusion. 
um, something that could really stress test uh, these workflows. So specifically, I was looking for elements with a wide dynamic range and something with pretty high saturation values that would be susceptible to distortion if they were mishandled, right? So I want it to be really obvious if my color management was wrong. I ended up using a Fusion preset, which I think you will find in your copy of DaVinci Resolve as well. I'm going to open up my effects panel, navigate to the templates folder, and then to Fusion, and then finally to particles. Inside of that, you're going to find this burning engine effect. I'm going to click and drag and place it in the note editor underneath. Let me move that across a little bit and then zoom out to show you what the whole effect looks like. And I can also send that final node, Soft Glow 3, into my viewer 2. There we go. So it's a really nice dramatic composite. It features particles, glowing elements, strong shadows, everything that I needed for these tests. Also, during my research, uh, I found that it was tricky to see some of the finer detail and the shifts in the gamma on a transparent background. So I also added a solid background to make it easier to assess visually. If you want to do this too, uh, I'm going to zoom in on my nodes, move my media node aside. And then after the soft glow, I'm going to add a background node. It will come together with the merge. I'll select background and change the background color to this cheerful shade of blue, and then connect the merge to my media out to see the final result. Now, by default, when you add a node, it's added as a foreground layer. So I'm going to select merge, press Control T to swap my inputs, and now the background is in the back. All right, so we're finally ready to talk about the color management itself. I'm going to head on over to the edit page for this phase, collapse my effects panel, and we begin with this non-color managed project. By the way, hello to everyone who's only just joining us from the timestamp. Uh, let's take a look at the project settings. So I've got those open. I'm in master settings by default. I'm going to head on over to color management. So this is how a new project appears by default. DaVinci YRGB as the color science means that it's display referred and not color managed. I'm going to leave that as it is. Uh, you may also notice that the timeline and output color spaces are both at Rec. 709 scene. The developers recommend this working color space for most users. The scene gamma refers to the 111 QuickTime tags and is intended for amateur and prosumer deliverables, like for example, YouTube, school projects, or for sharing with friends and family. You would only change these settings if you had a specific reason to. For example, if you were submitting to a film festival, a broadcaster, or perhaps creating a project for archiving, uh, there's loads of reasons to change these settings. But the general rule is, if you are not sure, then you can just leave them as they are. And here's my Fusion composition already in place. When I enter Fusion, the composition looks exactly the same. Hopefully, this is intuitive. Since we have not enabled color management, there's no remapping occurring. In fact, even the Fusion Viewer LUT is inactive, so I can click on it and it won't do anything to the image underneath. All the work that we perform in Fusion at this stage will be in sRGB linear, which is how it will then appear in the remainder of the DaVinci Resolve pages. The only issue you might experience at this stage is when monitoring your composite on an external monitor. I'll select the media out at the end of this pipeline and press 3 to output it to my Flanders Scientific HD grading monitor. As you can see, there's some ugly artifacting in the highlights at the center of the burning image. Curiously, when I moved to the other pages in Resolve, I did not get this artifacting. The graphic looks exactly the same as it does in the viewer. It's only in Fusion that the highlights fail. And I believe it's because my monitor is attempting to show a gamma 2.4 image, whereas Fusion is outputting a linear signal in a 32-bit floating point working space, and it's not being correctly tone mapped. On the other pages, the graphic is displayed at the more manageable timeline color space of Rec. 709 scene, so it appears correct. Thankfully, the fix for this behavior in Fusion is very simple. I can add a color space transform node after the media out node, 
and change the way that the signal is output. So the input color space in gamma, I can leave alone. I want this to operate within Fusion's color space. The output color space can stay the same. Uh, so it's still going to be sRGB Rec. 709. But the output gamma, I am going to set to gamma 24, which is what my monitor is set to display. I'm going to make sure that tone mapping is enabled and set to DaVinci. And then uh, what's also very important is that I apply a forward opto-optical transfer function. Now, when I send the signal from the color space transform node to my grading monitor, the graphic looks correct. I'm going to name this node so I can keep track of its function. And by the way, I placed it after the media out node so that it's not included in the final render of my composition. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, only the nodes leading up to the media out uh, will make up the final composite. Anything past that, I am using purely for monitoring purposes. And that's pretty much it. I want you to keep this in mind, even when you're working in a non-color managed project, that you might not always be able to see your graphics correctly if your grading monitor is incorrectly configured or simply incapable of displaying certain gamuts or dynamic ranges. Keep an eye out for that. All right, and now a summary for those of you who want a very quick explanation. There is no action needed if you're working in a non-color managed project. The composite should look exactly the same across all pages. However, if you're working with an external monitor, you might want to add a color space transform node after the media out to ensure the gamma is correctly displayed. Let's move on to working in a color managed project, specifically in standard dynamic ranges. So let me open up my project manager, and I'm just going to make a duplicate of this project. Copy and paste. And I'm going to rename this to Fusion Resolve Color Management SDR. And now we're going to open it up and head on over to the edit page. I'm now going to open up my project settings, go into color management, and we are going to enable color management in the color science tab by selecting DaVinci YRGB color managed. So by default, you get automatic color management ticked and your color processing mode and output is set to SDR standards which is actually the ideal option for most users. I find that automatic color management does a fantastic job of uh, recognizing the source color space of most clips and mapping them correctly. So since this is what I feel most people could potentially be using, I'm going to leave it as is. Though later on, I'll demonstrate that the setup also works across all SDR standards. But for now, I'll click Save. And after a moment, the image in the viewer changes. Uh, the brightness pops and the colors look a little bit washed out. And the reason this is happening is because the composition in Fusion is now being mapped from its sRGB linear starting point to the SDR grading environment of Rec. 709 scene. Let me head on over to Fusion. All right, so I'll have the same result in uh, the viewer. But if I disable the Fusion viewer LUT, which is performing the same conversion, then I'll see my original composition. This problem is unique to compositions that are created in a non-color managed project, and then that project has color management enabled. So you may have seen this happening uh, to your own graphics. And the reason is because even though the composition was created in a linear color space, the end result was designed to look like Reg 709. This is why it's so important to set up all your color management before you start compositing and grading. You never want to create your graphics and looks for the wrong color space. Now that we've enabled color management, the burning engine composite is being double color managed. So let me send this signal to viewer number one without the viewer LUT. This merge node represents the final state of the composite in the linear color space. It's an sRGB image that's being mapped from linear to sRGB again, which is resulting in this blown out look. Ideally, the composition should be in a linear space in order for this conversion to look correct. So our current goal is to change the end behavior of the pipeline to be linear and not sRGB. Uh, by the way, if you're starting your SDR project from scratch, you will not need to perform these changes. This is only for those of us who are trying to adapt graphics from a non-color managed environment into a color managed one. So I'm going to reverse the color conversions of the Fusion Viewer LUT by adding a color space transform node before my media out. Let me move these two nodes aside. And I'm also going to zoom in a little bit so you can see better. I'll select the merge node, shift spacebar, color space transform. 
Okay, and the starting point of this composition is sRGB, so I'll choose that as my gamma. And then I want the output to be linear so that everything that reaches the media out node is handled correctly. I don't actually need any tone mapping, so I'll set this to none, none for the gamut, and I don't need any OOTF adjustments. And the result that I now get in viewer two, which is showing my media out node with the Fusion Viewer LUT enabled, is now correct. So I can kind of verify that visually by looking on the left and the right in the viewers, but we can never be too sure. So if you want to be pixel perfect with your matching, you will want to bring both of these images into one viewer and then split wipe between them. So we have this buffer function in the top left corner of all the viewers. We have buffer A and B, which allows us to send two signals into the viewer at the same time. And then the third option here is to enable split wipe. Right now it's set to A, which is showing us our media out. I'll set it to B and send that merge node there as well. I'm just going to pick it up with my mouse and drag and drop it directly into the viewer. We don't need the viewer left for this. We're seeing the original composite. So now I can press the comma and period keys to toggle between these two images. And you can tell that there's no difference at all, even though the name of the node is jumping at the top. And also one of the nodes has the Fusion Viewer LUT enabled and the other one doesn't. If I press the forward slash key, then that will bring up the buffer split wipe. And I can even click and drag to compare it more thoroughly. All right, so I'm very happy with these results. We've undone the double color management. I'm going to ceremoniously draw a big blue box around this entire composite together with this color space transform that I applied to kind of represent all hypothetical compositions going forward in all the other examples that I'm going to be showing you. So I'm just going to, again, shift spacebar, add an underlay. OK, but wait, even after reversing the color management between the Fusion and Edit Pages, there is still a discrepancy. And when I say Edit Page from now on, I mean all the other Resolve pages that are not Fusion. I'm going to enter the Edit Page, and I've already got the viewers lined up pretty well. Hopefully you can see this shift occurring. It's pretty dramatic. The composition in the edit page has much darker shadows. And this is because my timeline and Apple color space is not sRGB. The gamut is correct. Rec 709 and sRGB are effectively the same, but the gamma is not. There are two solutions to this gamma shift that occurs in SDR color managed projects. The first one can be performed in the edit page itself. So I'm out here on the timeline, and I'm going to add a color space transform directly to the Fusion clip in the edit page. I'll open up my effects panel, and then in the open effects, I'll click and drag color space transform to the Fusion composition. And then in the inspector, I'm going to click on the effects tab. And here I'll want to manage this from its starting position. So use Fusion's sRGB linear starting point, but then I want it to output not to Rec. 709 scene, but rather to sRGB. Uh, once again, I don't need tone mapping at this stage and I don't need the OOTFs. I can collapse the effects. And now when I click between Fusion and the edit page, I have identical results. So you can be confident that when you're working in Fusion, you're going to be getting the exact right colors in the edit page. Plus, because most of the parameters that are used across these two pages are set to use timeline, it means that if you were to change your color management from automatic to a specific standard, like say Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4, the gamma will shift accordingly. So this is a future-proof solution. However, having shown you this, I realized this solution might not be ideal for compositors who prefer to have the image appear exactly as it did in Fusion. So in that case, there's also a second solution, and it's a way to color manage within Fusion so that no additional effects are needed on the other pages. I'm going to begin by removing the color space transform solution by clicking on the little trash icon. And then I'm going to head on over to Fusion, and we're essentially going to create our own viewer color management on the pipeline. So I'll begin by disabling the existing Fusion Viewer LUT. In the top left corner, All right, and that's actually showing us uh, the linear composition right now. I'm going to move my Flanders node down because we'll address external monitoring later on. 
And I'm going to create a new color space transform node after the media out so I can send this color managed image into the viewer, but not affect the final composition. All right, I'll connect the media out, send it to viewer two, and then I'll use this uh, CST to map the colors from Fusion's internal linear gamma to the project's default color and gamma settings. So I've set the input gamma to linear and I've left everything else as is. I can even change the tone mapping to none as well because there's nothing dramatic happening in terms of the luminance and then keep the OLTFs unticked and we're done. So now when I switch between the edit and the Fusion pages, what I see in both viewers is identical. When you switch back to Fusion, by the way, please remember to send the right node into the viewer. Otherwise, by default, you're going to be seeing the media out every time. So once I send the color space transform, once again, it matches the edit page. But despite this perfect match between the edit and Fusion pages, I'm still seeing a mismatch between the merge node on the left and the color space transform at the end. So hopefully you can kind of see that the shadows are darker, but again, I can verify by using the buffer split wipe. So I've still got uh, my color space transform set to the A buffer and I've still got the merge on the B. And when I toggle between them, you can see that the merge is a little lighter. And this is because the output color space of my project is gamma 2.4, whereas the composition state is sRGB. So there is a little bit of a gamma shift, which I can fix by either adding a new CST node before the color space transform at the end of my composition, and then converting the composition to gamma 2.4 from sRGB, or I can simply change the existing CST. So instead of my input gamma being sRGB, I'm going to choose gamma 2.4. And I'll also apply an inverse OOTF to change the treatment of the data levels. And now I'll compare the color space transform to the merge node. And now there's a perfect match. Now, I knew that this setup of the color space transform would work from the start. But if I set it up this way to begin with, um, I, it would have been harder for me to justify why this change had to occur. So I kind of wanted to show you the organic process that led me to these settings. If you're using an external grading monitor, you'll want to make sure that you add this color space transform before your monitor node. So I could just disconnect my Flanders node, drag it to the end of the CST and connect them. And when I send this signal out to my external monitor, the colors will look correct. But if you'd rather keep these two processes separate, then you can just change some of the settings inside your monitor node. So I'll drag my Flanders back to where it was send the media out signal to it. And I'm just going to make sure that the input gamma is set to linear, keep my output gamma 2.4, DaVinci tone mapping, and leave everything else as it is. All right, and now I want to talk about working with all the other SDR standards. Let's say you prefer to work in the broadcast gamma 2.4 standard. I'm going to go into my project settings, disable automatic color management, and I'm going to expand my color processing mode so I can select custom at the end. This will unpack the default Rec 709 setup and allow me to access its individual parameters. All I'd have to do here is set the output color space to any standard that I'm actually interested in outputting. So in this example, I set gamma 2.4. Uh, this is all I would need to do. I can then click save. And as you can see, nothing happens to the image in the viewer. So this is what I meant by future-proofed workflows. Uh, if I go into Fusion, the colors also remain consistent. Of course, uh, presuming I'm sending the right signal into the viewer, of course, so there you go. That's consistent with the edit page as well. Um, if I go back into the project settings, I do want to acknowledge that there's also the input color space, which ideally should be your camera rushes if you have them. But in the case of Fusion, the input won't matter so much because of Fusion's constant starting point of sRGB linear. And I wouldn't advise changing the timeline color space at this stage because you've already started working on uh, the nature of the colors in the Fusion pipeline. And making changes to the timeline color space is actually going to change the working color space of DaVinci Resolve. So this is where you could end up sort of failing yourself uh, and shifting the luminance of the image. So I've said this before, uh, but this is why it's so important to set up your color management before you start working in Fusion or grading. But if you absolutely had to make a change, uh, that's fine because this would just result in a slight gamma shift, which you can correct in the CST node in Fusion. 
Okay, so to quickly summarize, if you're bringing fusion compositions from a non-color managed project, you will need to apply a color space transform to convert that composition from sRGB to linear. To fix the gamma shift between the fusion and edit pages, you can either apply a color space transform in the edit page to the fusion clip to get a match between the edit and fusion pages, or inversely, you can do this from the fusion page by adding a color space transform node after the media out, sending that into the viewer and disabling the fusion viewer LUT and converting the composition from linear to the project color space. If you're working in a Gamma 2.4 project, you might also need to make an adjustment to that original color space transform to make sure it's being interpreted as Gamma 2.4 and not sRGB. And when it comes to your external monitor, you will want to make sure that the input gamma is set to linear so that the conversion is correct between the fusion page and your monitoring standard. Okay, next, I'd like to take a look at working in high dynamic ranges. So once again, I'm going to make a copy of an existing project. I'm going to select my standard dynamic range project, copy and paste. And then I'm going to rename it from SDR to HDR, high dynamic range. And in fact, I'm going to append DaVinci White Gamut because that's the standard we're gonna be working in. I feel that that's the one uh, most people have issues with. So I'm gonna click OK. There it is, gonna double click to enter, jump into the edit page so I can see the result when I make uh, changes to my project settings. OK, so we're still in the standard dynamic range right now. I'm going to open up the project settings, click on color management, and I'm going to change my color processing mode to DaVinci White Gamut. I'm also going to make sure that my output color space matches my grading monitor, which is Rexon 09 Gamma 2.4, and then I'm going to click Save. So immediately the image looks distorted. This is something you've likely noticed if you've tried working in Fusion in the DaVinci White Gamut. And I believe this is happening uh, due to a miscommunication between several color management systems. The project color space is DaVinci White Gamut, whereas Fusion is still operating within its own RGB linear color space, which is independent from the other pages in DaVinci Resolve. One quick solution to this problem is to just bypass color management and then manually color manage the clip using a color space transform node in the edit page. So I can do this by right-clicking on the Fusion clip choosing Bypass Color Management. So now it looks just like the linear version of the composition that we saw in the SDR project. And I'm going to open up my Effects panel. Oh, let's just make it shorter, collapse it, there we go. And I'll drag the Color Space Transform node onto this Fusion composition. Drag my effects. Then enter the Effects panel in the Inspector. And I'm just going to indicate that the starting point of this composition is sRGB linear. There we go. I want to output uh, to the timeline, and I don't actually need tone mapping, so I'm going to disable that. And I'll need to apply a forward OOTF because when I was color managing my composition in the Fusion page previously, I had applied an inverse OOTF. So I need to kind of reverse that function to get the correct data levels. Now, when I jump between the edit and fusion pages, I'll find that my viewer matches the end stage of the composition, which was my merge node. So there it is with the fusion viewer LUT enabled. When I switch back to the edit page, that is identical. However, I don't really recommend this solution. Uh, number one is because it's not very future proof, right? If you're creating multiple deliverables, you'd have to go into each clip on the timeline and adjust this color space transform to accommodate for all the potential outputs that you're going to render. It then makes the usage of the DaVinci White Gamut pointless on a project level. So this solution doesn't take advantage of the super wide working gamut of DaVinci White Gamut. Um, I suppose it would make sense if your timeline was mostly raw media and that's what you were using DaVinci White Gamut for, and maybe you had just a few Fusion clips that you wanted to manually uh, color manage. But if your whole project is Fusion-based, then you may as well work in a non-color managed project, you know, if you're going to do that. Or you could use the DaVinci White Gamut friendly future-proof solution that I'm about to show you next. Um, I'll begin by removing this Band-Aid, this temporary solution and I'm going to re-enable the color management on the clip. 
So as much as possible, I avoid bypassing just because I do like the idea of a future-proofed project. I'm going to head on back to the Fusion page. And I'm going to remove some of these settings because they were particular for the SDR setup, which means we don't need them so much. I'm going to select both of the nodes that I created after my media out. Give me a clean starting point. And I also want to address the sRGB to linear conversion that I had applied at the end of the burning engine effect. So we were upscaling from a non-resolve color managed project and I'd use this to turn it linear. And then I made some changes to it in the previous iteration, but I'm going to reset it to its original setting of sRGB to linear with no tone mapping or OOTFs. So if you're upscaling your effect from a non-resolve color managed project, you'll likely need to apply this conversion to make sure that the signal that is reaching the media out node is linear. And also, by the way, from now on, whenever I use the word upscaling, I mean it in terms of color management. So scaling up to a wider gamut as opposed to scaling up the resolution. I know it's not the best term, but I'm not aware of like a color management equivalent of upscaling. So there it is. And in case you jumped ahead to this part of the video and you were starting your fusion composition from scratch, then you don't even have to worry about all this because you're not color managing an existing composition. So you can just proceed with the remainder of the solution that I'm about to show you. So first of all, I would like to match what we see in the fusion viewer at the media out node stage with what we see in the edit page. Like that's the first thing that we need to solve. And right now there is a huge discrepancy. We are going to build our own color management on the pipeline, which means that we want to disable the Fusion Viewer LUT in the viewer. And we're then going to add a couple of color space transform nodes after the media out. So let's shift spacebar, color space transform. There we go. So at this first stage, we want to convert the starting point of the composition from linear to the DaVinci wide gamut working color space. I will leave my tone mapping enabled to DaVinci with no OOTFs. Now, if I send that into the viewer, that's still not going to look correct, but at least we have it in the right working color space for this project. Now I can apply a second color space transform. And even if I don't understand the maths behind the DaVinci white gamut and the intermediate gamma that it uses, by leaving the input set to use timeline, I know that the conversion will figure it out for me because it has the maths intact. All I need to specify is the output, which is once again going to be Rec 709 Gamma 24 based on the monitor that I'm using and also on the deliverable that I have intended for this project. So you can change the output to whatever you need. I'll leave the tone mapping enabled to DaVinci, so this is actually quite important. And I'll also need to apply a forward OOTF. So let me take a look at what that looks like in the viewer. There it is. Uh, if I jump into the edit page, I will now see a perfect match, All right? So it might seem a bit weird that it's so important to get the image looking kind of worse first, but by being able to reverse engineer what the color management is doing between the fusion and edit pages, it now means that I can fix this incorrect mapping on the general pipeline and know that what I'm seeing in the Fusion Viewer is exactly what I'm going to end up seeing in the edit page. So this stage is actually really important. And I want to give full credit to Bernd from VFX Study for demonstrating this trick for this reverse engineering of the color management in Fusion. I used this technique a lot when I was trying to figure out how the Fusion signal was being mapped in these various color management systems. If you're interested in a more in-depth explanation of this solution and advice on how to create groups and custom LUTs uh, using this management, then I highly, highly recommend that you watch his video on this topic. So hopefully I've remembered to place a link on the video and I will definitely place it in the description. All right, and maybe because I have a more recent version of the software than Burned did in his video, I also found an alternative solution that utilizes just one node. So I'm going to leave these two in place because they are rock solid, but I'm going to add another color space transform that's independent, feed the same media out signal, but this time I am going to kind of bypass the middleman. I am going to use the same input settings of the first node and the same output settings of the second node to create this conversion internally. So that's from linear to Rec 709. And let me show you what the result looks like so far. There we go. I want to make sure that tone mapping is enabled and set to DaVinci. This is one of the more important steps. 
and I'll also have the forward OOTF enabled for the data levels. So I'm pretty much there, but if I was to jump to the edit page right now, you might see that there's an almost imperceptible shift in uh, like the upper highlights and the luminance, especially like around uh, the top edge over here. Let me jump back into Fusion, and uh, this is going to reset itself to the media out node. So I'm going to make sure I send this color space transform back into the viewer, and I can compare it to the other solution that I had. And you can see there's just that slight adjustment to the brightest portion of the image. So I found that the way to fix this is to apply a max input, right? And what's interesting is that it doesn't have to be a big change. I took it from 100 to 101. And then that perfectly replicated the highlights on this second solution. And when I go into the edit page, you can now see a perfect match between this one node solution and what we're seeing in the edit page. So yeah, with these nodes, I'll now be able to work on my fusion composition, knowing that what I'm seeing in the viewer with these color space transforms is exactly what's going to end up on the edit page. Uh, just make sure that when you're switching back and forth that you're always adjusting what you're seeing to the color space transform as opposed to the default media out. And of course, make sure that your Fusion Viewer LUT is disabled as you do that. Both of these solutions will work for your external monitor without any further adjustments. So if I press 3, I'm sending the signal out to my Flanders monitor and I get the exact same visuals. So the only exception would be is if your grading monitor standard is different from what you're outputting. So you might want to make a duplicate of these nodes and then change the output color, space, and gamma accordingly to suit your monitor. All right, so if you're creating fusion compositions from scratch, then you're pretty much good to go. Um, but if you are trying to bring in an older composition into a DaVinci Wide Gamut project, uh, like I am right now, you'll of course notice that the colors are still way off like the ones in this burning engine composite. So if I send my merge node into viewer one, I'll show you what the original will look like. And I have to disable the fusion viewer LUT to make sure I'm getting the original colors. So this is what I'm trying to achieve. How do we work with fusion compositions retroactively? Uh, I'm going to have to add a color space transform node prior to the media out. And I'm going to call this my recovery mode. OK, so I'm recovering the colors to their original state. All right, so give it a label. And what I'm trying to do with this node is take the sRGB linear like endpoint of this composition and adapt it to the DaVinci White gamut working space. So I'll have to change my color space to sRGB and linear. Okay. And then I'm going to use the DaVinci White Gamut, so I'm going to leave Use Timeline. Uh, but I do want to map it to a linear gamma. Once again, the DaVinci Tone Mapping is going to be doing a lot of heavy lifting here. Uh, we'll leave it on, and once again, we will apply a limit to the max input. So I'm going to tick it, and then select the 100 and replace it with 101. All right, and that's just adjusted some of the overexposure in the highlights and on the edges. If I disable that, you can see it might be forward and after. So that's brought it much closer to the original composition on the left. And then, of course, because the shadows are too dark, uh, once again, I'll want to inverse the OOTF. All right, so let's compare the original to the recovered graphic in my second viewer. I'll press comma for my A buffer. Press the full stop to open up my B buffer and drag the merge node into that. And make sure I disable my Fusion Viewer LUT. When I press the comma and period keys, I can compare the two and see that there's still a slight gamma shift remaining, which means that I need to go into my color space transform at the end of the pipeline and change the input gamma from sRGB to gamma 2.4 due to the overall output of my project. All right, now when I compare the two, I have a perfect match. OK, so that's it. I think this solution will account for most HDR workflows. Most of the settings that we used have referred to the project timeline settings as opposed to any specific color and gamma. So they should all map pretty consistently. Some of these are set up to work with my particular monitor. So wherever you see gamma 2.4, you might have to change those according to your monitoring standard. Uh, but as far as I can tell, that's the only big variable. I'm afraid I can't really test out all the different HDR standards on my end because I don't have access to an unlimited amount of HDR monitors. 
But if you try out a configuration on your end and you find that it works or that it doesn't work, please drop a comment and then I can keep track of where these processes fail. And maybe I'll be able to offer better solutions in the future. All right, in summary, for HDR and DaVinci Wide Gamut workflows, you have a few options. Uh, first, you can completely bypass color management on the clip in the edit page and apply a color space transform to match the colors of the Fusion clip to the original composition. Without bypassing color management, your options for preparing Fusion compositions from non-color managed projects is to first add a color space transform from sRGB to linear. And then to fix the color management between the Fusion and edit pages, you will need to add a color space transform node after the media out to adjust the composition from the DaVinci white gamut working color space in a linear gamma to whatever your output standard is. If you're doing this within a single node, you have to remember to apply a custom max input of 101 nits. And then thankfully, you can use the same nodes for your external monitor. If uh, once again, you're recovering an older composition, you may also need to adjust the colors between its original starting point and the DaVinci white gamut color space by applying a color space transform node before the media out. And if you still see a gamma shift, then you might need to go to the original sRGB to linear node and change sRGB to gamma 2.4 or potentially add another color space transform in which you perform this minor gamma correction. All right, and now we'll take a look at how to work in Fusion in an ACES project. And I'm just going to make a copy of the project I'm currently on, Command C, Command V. And I'm going to rename this one to Fusion RCM ACES. All right, I'm going to go in, open the edit page, and then I'm going to go into the project settings and set up my color management. So first for the color science, I can pick between ACES CC and CCT. Either of these two options are fine. The only real difference is that they will affect the behavior of my grading tools, uh, but not the initial interpretation of the image. So ACES CC is the more computationally pure algorithm curve, whereas ACES CCT has a tonal adjustment, which a lot of colorists prefer. To keep things simple, I'm gonna pick ACES CC. For the input transform, I'm going to make sure that I keep it on no input transform. If I had camera footage in this timeline, then I would want that to match the starting point of my media. But if you're working in Fusion only, then this won't make a difference because Fusion starting point, as I've said many times now, is sRGB linear, which we'll soon see, by the way, is part of the problem because ACES will be anticipating the AP1 color space as a starting point and not sRGB. But I'll get to that in a second. I'll disable the ACES reference gamut compress. It won't make too much of a difference now, but later on I saw that it did adjust the result in the viewer. And I'm going to set my output transform to Rec. 709 for my monitoring standard and for my deliverable. But of course you can set this to anything that you need according to your workflow. All right, and now I can click save. Before I continue with the solution, I'm also going to remove the nodes on my Fusion composition that I had introduced in the previous solutions. So let me jump into Fusion and there's my recovery node. I'm going to get rid of that, as well as all of the CCTs that I applied after the media out. And I'm going to change my input gamma here to sRGB, which I'll address later on in case you're just joining the video here. <laughs> So let me go back into the edit page. So this is usually what you're going to see if you were trying to work in Fusion in the ACES color management. It actually doesn't look too bad, but it is clearly incorrect. And there's some pretty substantial artifacting in the hottest part of the image in the highlights. Um, and the saturation also looks really wrong. It's oversaturated. Before we continue with the actual solution, I need to acknowledge that bypassing is a viable option if you're in a hurry or if there's very few clips on the timeline that you need to manage. Uh, to do that, you can right click the clip, choose Bypass Color Management, and that pretty much shows you the original composition and its linear color space. And then you can introduce a color space transform node from the effect panel, still in the edit page, drag and drop it over the clip. And then you can open up the effects tab in the inspector and set it to transform from sRGB linear to the current timeline. Uh, you don't even need to apply any tone mapping, and that's it. You're pretty much good to go.
Uh, but I wouldn't advise this as a general workflow because you're not negating the whole reason why we use project-wide color management and ACES color management in particular. So it's there in a pinch, but I don't recommend it. So let's remove this color space transform and re-enable color management on our clip. And now let's look at the genuine solution. Right, I'm going to go into Fusion, and the first thing I'd like to address is monitoring the signal in Fusion so that it matches what we see in the edit page. Right now, if I jump between Fusion and Edit, you can see that there's quite a substantial shift, which means that I can't really trust anything that I do on the pipeline prior to the media out because it will never look like this in the edit page. The composition I have, I set up at the beginning of this video. It was the Burning Engine template that comes with Fusion. And once I had it set up, I applied a color space transform node at the end of it to transform it from its sRGB starting point to a linear gamma color space. So it would be correctly mapped by the media out in standard dynamic range projects. Uh, so I had to modify this in various ways in the other color management configurations, uh, but I want to acknowledge that this node is here. Anything inside this blue box in your mind, you can replace with any kind of composition, whether it's old or new. But if you're starting a new composition, you will not need this color space transform. All right, so now we can proceed with matching the viewers. This is surprisingly easy to do with an ACES transform node after the media out. So I'll press shift spacebar, ACES transform. I'm going to send that into viewer two, so I'll press two. And I'll also want to deactivate the Fusion Viewer LED because the whole purpose of this is to create our own color management on the pipeline. So now we're seeing the linear result. If you look at the settings in the inspector, you'll see that they're both set to no input transform and no output transform. In ACES, what that actually indicates is that you're operating in the AP1 linear color space. But the unique component here is that we need to perform an ACES to REC709 conversion without including a gamma shift. And for that, there's a special setting. It's called ACES CG. So I'm going to select my input transform, scroll down, and there it is, ACES CG. So you can see that's separate from the CC and the CCT, which will include a gamma conversion. And then I'm going to send it to REC709. All right, so look what's happened in the viewer. Does it look great? No. But if I jump back into the edit page, it will look identical. And that's really, really good because it means that anything I do now on the pipeline prior to the media out will match what's on the edit page. Just remember that every time you jump back into Fusion, you need to select the ACES transform and send that into your viewer. Otherwise, you're going to be viewing the media out result, which is going to be inaccurate. If you've got an external monitor, you can use this exact same ACES transform for viewing your composition. So in my case, I'm going to press three and the signal will be sent to my Flanders Scientific and I'm going to see the exact same image. So there's no additional nodes or conversions necessary unless your output monitor uses a different monitoring standard from this output transform, in which case you can either add like a parallel ACES transform with the settings that you need. So you're still mapping from ACES CG or you could even potentially add a color space transform node that will perform that final conversion for you. Once again, huge thanks to Bern from BFX Study who demonstrates this exact conversion in a video that he has dedicated to ACES. It's a great video because he also provides additional explanations for how we operate in the ACES color space and what ACES CG actually means. I think he does a much better job than I do. On top of that, he also demonstrates some advanced Fusion Viewer and OCIO solutions to this problem. So I highly recommend you check this video out. But for this video, I'll stick to the limitations that I set for myself, which is to use simple workarounds with tools that are native to DaVinci Resolve. By the way, if you're creating compositions in Fusion from scratch, this solution should be all you need. However, if you're upscaling a Fusion composition from a project with a smaller gamut, you will still need to address this gamma shift in the image, which is what I'll do next. All right. so. Ideally, we want to convert the sRGB linear composition to ACES CG, right? Those are our two start and end points. So if I select color space transform, there it is. Its final position is linear. And then the start point here is ACES CG. Unfortunately, this is not something that I can do with just one node. Let's take a look at the color space transform. Even though it can accomplish the starting point that we need, it does not actually give us ACES CG as an option. 
And then inversely, the ACES transform does feature ACES CG as an option, but it does not account for the tone mapping that we need. So the best thing to do is to combine the two to get the optimal result. I'll start with the ACES transform that I already have in place, and I'll place it onto the pipeline before the media out node. So let me select all of these, make room. Okay, and I'm going to transform this signal from sRGB to ACES CG. Right, and that completes the connection to the final output and to the conversion that's going to happen between the media out node and the edit page. However, the gamma is still off in this image. Um, in fact, let's remind ourselves what the image is supposed to look like. That's the merge node in the, the blue box in the pipeline. I'll send that to viewer one, and you can see that it looks much cleaner with much more detail. So even though we have an sRGB transform, uh, we're not accounting for the tonal mapping. So for that, I'll create a color space transform and add it between the two nodes. Here, I am going to set linear as my input gamma. That's how the color space transform is outputting it from the blue underlay. And then I'll set the output gamma to sRGB. I'll also want to limit my max input to 100 nits. And I need no further conversions, no OOTFs. So now it's in exactly the right spot that it needs to be in when it enters the ACES transform node. It now matches my merge node. And if I go into the edit page, it matches the viewer in the edit page as well. So from start to finish, this is now an effective solution. Uh, by the way, if you do already have this color space transform at the end of your composition when you're upscaling, you can further simplify this process because right now we have like four different color conversions occurring by deleting this node and performing the conversion to sRGB from my existing color space transform. So I'll start in the gamma 2.4 color space, send it to sRGB, so it's a very mild gamma shift. And I'll also want to enable DaVinci tone mapping to get the result that I need. So as a final check, I've got my buffer A set to ACES transform, got my buffer B set to merge, and when I toggle between them, I see no difference, and that's how I know I have a perfect match. And that's it. We're now matched up from the original composition to the fusion view via the ACES transform to the edit page. All three of them are matched up beautifully. So to summarize, one of your options when working in ACES is to bypass color management and apply a color space transform to your clip in the edit page to get a graphic to behave as you're expecting it to, though this is not the most efficient way of working. A better solution will be to apply color management on the pipeline in Fusion. So if you're bringing in Fusion compositions from a non-color managed project, you'll want to first apply a color space transform from sRGB to linear. And then to fix the color management between the Fusion and edit pages, you will want to apply an ACES transform after the media out node. This node, which will convert from the ACES CG starting point to Rec. 709, can also be output to your external monitor if needed. Uh, by the way, if you're upscaling, you'll find that you still need to make an adjustment to how the colors and gamma are treated. So you can add an ACES transform before the media out to transform from sRGB to ACES CG, and then either add another CST node before that, transforming from linear to sRGB, or you can just replace your original color space transform to map from gamma 24 to sRGB. Okay, and that concludes my research on color management and fusion. Altogether, this took me weeks to put together, but I felt really satisfied to finally have answers to questions that have been on my mind for a long time. I've put together a written summary, which hopefully will be ready by the time I upload this video, uh, that you'll find in the video description. If you've spotted any mistakes, or if you found a more efficient way to achieve the same results, I encourage you to comment and share your wisdom. I think we can all benefit from each other's experience. I'm really eager to keep exploring more color management solutions in DaVinci Resolve, specifically when working with EXR media and intermediaries. So these will likely be my next videos. All right, so enough out of me. Thank you for your time. I've been Daria Fassoon, and you've been great.